betrayal. That's the first thing I feel, which is ludicrous. For there to be betrayal, there would have to be some trust first between Peta and me. And trust has not been part of the agreement. We're tributes. But the boy who risked a beating to give me bread, the one who steadied me in the sh chariot, who covered for me with the red-headed Avox girl, who insisted Hamish know my hunting skills, was there some part of me that couldn't help trusting him? On the other hand, I'm relieved that we can stop the pretense of being friends. Obviously, whatever thin connection we'd foolishly formed has been severed. And high time, too. The games begin in two days, and trust will only be a weakness. Whatever triggered Peta's decision, and I suspect it had to do with him out with me outperforming him in training, I should be nothing but grateful for it. Maybe he's finally accepted the fact that the sooner we openly acknowledge that we are enemies, the better. Good, I say. So what's the schedule? You'll each have four hours with Effie for presentation and four with me for content, says Hamish. You start with Effie, Katniss. I can't imagine what Effie will have to teach me that could take four hours, but she's got me working down to the last minute. We go to my room and she puts me in a full-length gown and high-heeled shoes, not the ones I'll be wearing for the actual interview, and instructs me on the walking. The shoes are the worst part. I've never worn high heels and can't get used to essentially wobbing around on the balls of my feet. But Effie runs around in them full time, and I'm determined that if she can do it, so can I. The dress, po the dress poses another problem. It keeps tangling around my shoes, so of course I hitch it up. And then Effie swoops down on me like a hawk, smacking my hands and yelling, Not above the ankle! When I finally conquer the walking, they're still sitting, posture, Apparently, I have a tendency to duck my head, eye contact, hand gestures, and smiling. Smiling is mostly about smiling more. Effie makes me say 100 banal phrases starting with a smile, while smiling or ending with a smile. By lunch, the muscles in my cheeks are twitching from overuse. Well, that's the best I can do, Effie says with a sigh. Just remember, Katniss, we want the audience to like you. And you don't think they will? I ask. Not if you glare at them the entire time. Why don't you save that for the arena? Instead, think of yourself among friends, says Effie. They're betting on how long I'll live, I burst out. They're not my friends. Well, try and pretend, snaps Effie. Then she composes herself and beams me. See, like this. I'm smiling at you, even though you're aggravating me. Yes, it feels very convincing, I say. I'm going to eat. I kick off my heels and stomp down to the dining room, hiking my skirt up to my thighs. Peta and Hamish seem in, pre seem in pretty good moods, so I'm thinking the content session may be an improvement over the morning. I couldn't be more wrong. After lunch, Hamish takes me into the sitting room, directs me to the couch, and then just frowns at me for a while. What? I finally ask. I'm trying to figure out what to do with you, he says. How we're going to present you. Are you going to be charming? Aloof? Fierce? So far, you're shining like a star. You volunteer to save your sister. Cinemade, you look unforgettable. You've got the top training score. People are intrigued, but no one knows who you are. The impression you make tomorrow will decide exactly what I can get you in terms of sponsors, says Hamish. Having watched the tribute interviews all my life, I know there's truth to what he's saying. If you appeal to the crowd, either by being humorous or brutal or eccentric, you gain favor. What's Peta's approach? Or am I not allowed to ask? I say. Likeable. He has a sort of self-deprecating humor, naturally, says Hamish, whereas when you open your mouth, you come across more as sullen and hostile. I do not, I say. Please, I don't know where you pulled that cheery, wavy girl on the chariot from, but I haven't seen her before or since, says Hamish. And you've given me so many reasons to be cheery, I counter. But you don't have to please me. I'm not going to sponsor you. So pretend I'm the audience, says Hamish. Delight me. Fine, I say. I snarl. Hamish takes the role of the interviewer, and I try to answer his questions in a winning fashion. But I can't. I'm too angry with Hamish for what he said, and that I even have to answer the questions. All I can think is how unjust the whole thing is, the Hunger Games. Why am I hopping around like some trained dog trying to please people I hate? The longer the interview goes on, the more my fury seems to rise to the surface, until I'm literally spitting out answers at him. All right, enough, he says. We've got to find another angle. Not only are you hostile, I don't know anything about you. I've asked you 50 questions and still have no sense of your life, your family, what you care about. They want to know about you, Katniss. 
but I don't want them to. They're already taking my future. They can't have the things that mattered to me in the past, I say. Then lie, make something up, says Hamish. I'm not good at lying, I say. Well, you better learn fast. You've got about as much charm as a dead slug, says Hamish. Ouch, that hurts. Even Hamish must know he's been too harsh because his voice softens. Here's an idea. Try acting humble. Humble, I echo. Then you can't, that you can't believe a little girl from District 12 has done this well. The whole thing's been more than you ever could have dreamed of. Talk about Sinna's clothes, how nice the people are, how the city amazes you. If you won't talk about yourself, at least compliment the audience. Just keep turning it back around, all right? Gush. The next hours are agonizing. At once, it's clear I cannot gush. We try me playing cocky, but I just don't have the arrogance. Apparently, I'm too vulnerable for ferocity. I'm not witty, funny, sexy, or mysterious. By the end of the session, I am no one at all. Hamish, Hamish started drinking somewhere around witty, and a nasty edge has crept into his voice. I give up, sweetheart. Just answer the questions and try not to let the audience see how openly you despise them. I have dinner that night in my room, ordering an outrageous number of delicacies, eating myself sick, and then taking out my anger at Hamish, at the Hunger Games, at every living being in the capital by smashing dishes around my room. When the girl with the red hair comes in to turn down my bed, her eyes widen at the mess. Just leave it, I yell at her. Just leave it alone. I hate her too, with her knowing reproachful eyes that call me a coward, a monster, a puppet of the capital, both now and then. For her, justice must be finally happening. At least my death will help pay for the life of the boy in the woods. But instead of fleeing the room, the girl closes the door behind her and goes to the bathroom. She comes back with a damp cloth and wipes my face gently, then cleans the blood from the broken plate off my hands. Why is she doing this? Why am I letting her? I should have tried to save you, I whisper. She shakes her head. Does this mean we were right to stand by? That she has forgiven me? No, it was wrong, I say. She taps her finger, her lips with her fingers, then points to my chest. I think she means that I would have just ended up in Avox too. Probably would have, in Avox or dead. I spent the next hour helping the redheaded girl clean the room. When all the garbage has been dropped down a disposal and the food cleaned away, she turns down my bed. I crawl in between the sheets like a five-year-old and let her tuck me in. Then she goes. I want her to stay until I fall asleep, to be there when I wake up. I want the pr protection of this girl, even though she never had mine. In the morning, it's not the girl, but my prep team who are hanging over me. My lessons with Effie and Hamish are over. This day belongs to Sinna. He's my last hope. Maybe he can make me look wonderful, so no one will care what comes out of my mouth. The team works on me until late afternoon, turning my skin into glowing satin, stenciling patterns on my arms, painting flame designs on my 20 perfect nails. Then Vinny, then Vinia goes to work on my hair, weaving strands of red into a pattern that begins at my left ear, wraps around my head, then falls in one braid down my right shoulder. They erase my face with a layer of pale makeup and draw my features back out. Huge dark eyes, full red lips, lashes that throw off bits of light when I blink. Finally, they cover my entire body in a power that makes me powder that makes me shimmer in gold dust. Then Senna enters with what I assume is my dress, but I can't really see it because it's covered. Close your eyes, he orders. I can feel the silken inside as they slip it down over my naked body. Then the weight. It must be 40 pounds. I clutch Octavia's hand as I blindly step into my shoes, glad to find they are at least two inches lower than the pair Effie had me practice in. There is some adjusting and fidgeting, then silence. Can I open my eyes? I ask. Yes, says Sina. Open them. The creature standing before me in the full-length mirror has come from another world, where the skin shimmers and eyes flash, and apparently they can't. They make their clothes from jewels, because my dress, oh, my dress, is entirely covered in reflective precious gems, red and yellow and white with bits of blue that accent the tips of the flame design. The slightest movement gives the impression I am engulfed in tongues of fire. I am not pretty. I am not beautiful. I am as radiant as the sun. For a while, we all just stare at me. Oh, Sinna, I whisper. Thank you. Twirl for me, he says. I hold out my arms and spin in a circle. The prep team screams in admiration. 
Senna dismisses the team and has me move around in the dress and shoes, which are infinitely more manageable than Effie's. The dress hangs in such a way that I don't have to lift the skirt when I walk, leaving me with one less thing to worry about. So, all ready for the interview then? asks Senna. I can see by his expression that he's been talking to Hamish, that he knows how dreadful I am. I'm awful. Hamish called me a dead slug. No matter what we tried, I couldn't do it. I just can't be one of those people he wants me to be, I say. Senna thinks about it for this a moment. Why don't you just be yourself? Myself? That's no good either. Hamish says I'm sullen and hostile, I say. Well, you are. Around Hamish, says Senna with a grin. I don't find you so. The prep team adores you. You even won over the game makers. And for the citizens of the capital, well, they can't stop talking about you. No one can help but admire your spirit. My spirit. That's a new thought. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but it suggests I'm a fighter, in a sort of brave way. It's not as if I'm never friendly. Okay, maybe I don't go around loving everybody I meet. Maybe my smiles are hard to come by, but I do care for some people. Senna takes my icy hands in his warm ones. Suppose, when you answer the questions, you think you're addressing a friend back home. Who might this best friend be? asks Senna. Gail, I say instantly. Only it doesn't make sense, Senna. I would never be telling Gail those things about me. He already knows them. What about me? Could you think of me as a friend? Says Senna. Of all the people I've met since I left home, Senna is by far my favorite. I liked him right off and he hasn't disappointed me yet. I think so, but I'll be sitting on the main platform with the other stylists. You'll be able to look right at me. When you're asked a question, find me and answer it as honestly as possible, says Senna. Even if I think it's horrible, I ask, because it might be, really. Especially if you think it's horrible, says Cinna. You'll try it? I nod. It's a plan. Or at least a straw to grasp at. Too soon, it's time to go. The interviews take place on a stage constructed in front of the training center. Once I leave my room, it will be only minutes until I'm in front of the crowd, the cameras, all of Pan Am. As Cinna turns the doorknob, I stop his hand. Cinna. I'm completely overcome with strange fright. Remember, they already love you, he says gently. Just be yourself. We meet up with the rest of District 12 crowd at the elevator. Portia and her gang have been hard at work. Peta looks striking in a black suit with flame accents. While we look well together, it's a relief not to be dressed identically. Hamish and Effie are all fancied up for the occasion. I avoid Hamish, but accept Effie's compliments. Effie can be tiresome and clueless, but she's not destructive like Hamish. When the elevator opens, the other tributes are being lined up to take the stage. All 24 of us sit in a big arc throughout the interviews. I'll be last, or second to last, since the girl tribute precedes the boy from each district. How I wish I could be first and get the whole thing out of the way. Now I'll have to listen to how witty, funny, humble, fierce, and charming everybody else is before I go up. Plus, the audience will start to get bored, just as the game makers did. And I can't exactly shoot an arrow into the crowd to get their attention. Right before we parade onto the stage, Hamish comes up behind Peta and me and growls. Remember, you're still a happy pair, so act like it. What? I thought we abandoned that when Peta asked for separate coaching. But I guess that was a private, not a public thing. Anyway, there's not much chance for interaction now as we walk single file to our seats and take our places. Just stepping on the stage makes my breathing rapid and shallow. I can feel my pulse pounding in my temples. It's a relief to get to my chair because between the heels and my legs shaking, I'm afraid I'll trip. Although evening is falling, the city circle is brighter than a summer's day. An elevated seating unit has been set up for prestigious guests, with the stylist commanding the front row. The cameras will turn to them and when the crowd is reacting to their handiwork. A large balcony off of building to the right has been reserved for the game makers. Television crews have claimed most of the other balconies but the city circle and the avenues that feed into it are completely packed with people, standing room only. At homes and community halls around the country, every television set is turned on. Every citizen of Pan Am is tuned in. There will be no blackouts tonight. Caesar Flickerman, the man who has hosted the interviews for more than 40 years, bounces onto the stage. It's a little scary because his appearance has been virtually unchanged during all that time. Same face under a coating of pure white makeup. Same hairstyle that he dyes a different color for each Hunger Games. Same ceremonial suit, midnight blue dotted with a thousand tiny electric bulbs like that twinkle like stars. 
They do surgery to in the capital to make people appear younger and thinner. In District 12, looking old is something of an achievement since so many people die early. You see an elderly person, you want to congratulate them on their longevity. Ask the secret of survival. A plump person is envied because they aren't scraping by like the majority of us. But here it is different. Wrinkles aren't desirable. A round belly isn't a sign of success. This year, Caesar's hair is powder blue and his eyelids and lips are coated in the same hue. He looks freakish, but less frightening than he did last year, when his color was crimson and he seemed to be bleeding. Caesar tells a few jokes to warm up the audience, but then gets down to business. The girl tribute from District 1, looking provocative in a see-through gold gown, steps up to the center of the stage to join Caesar for her interview. You can tell her mentor didn't have any trouble coming up with an angle for her. With that flowing blonde hair, emerald green eyes, her body tall and lush, she's sexy all the way. Each interview only lasts three minutes. Then a buzzer goes off and the next tribute is up. I'll say this for Caesar. He really does his best to make the tribute shine. He's friendly, tries to set the nervous ones at ease, laughs at lame jokes, and can turn a weak response into a memorable one, all by the way he reacts. I sit like a lady, the way Effie showed me, as the districts slip by, two, three, four. Everyone seems to be playing up this some angle. The monstrous boy from District 2 in, is a ruthless killing machine. The fox-faced girl from District 5, sly and elusive. I spotted Cinna as soon as he took his place, but even his presence cannot relax me. Eight, nine, ten. The crippled boy from ten is very quiet. My palms are sweating like crazy, but the jeweled dress is an absorbent and they skid right off as skid right off if I try to dry them. Eleven. Rue, who is dressed in a gossamer gown complete with wings, flutters her way to Caesar. A hush falls over the crowd at the side of this magical wisp of a tribute. Caesar's very sweet with her, complimenting her seven in training, an excellent score for one so small. When he asks her what her greatest strength in the arena will be, she doesn't hesitate. I'm very hard to catch, she says in a tremulous voice, and if they can't catch me, they can't kill me, so don't count me out. I wouldn't in a million years, says Caesar encouragingly. The boy tribute from District 11, Thresh, has the same dark skin as Rue, but the resemblance stops there. He's one of the giants, probably six and a half feet tall and built like an ox, but I notice he rejected the invitations from the career tributes to join their crowd. Instead, he's been very solitary, speaking to no one, showing little interest in training. Even so, he scored a 10, and it's not hard to imagine he impressed the game makers. He ignores Caesar's attempts at banter and answers with a yes or no, or just remains silent. If only I was his size, I could get away with sullen and hostile, and it would be just fine. I bet half the sponsors are at least considering him. If I had any money, I'd bet on him myself. And then they're calling Katniss Everdeen, and I feel myself as if in a dream, standing and making my way center stage. I shake Caesar's outstretched hand, and he has the good grace not to immediately wipe his hand off on his suit. So, Katniss, the capital must be quite a change from District 12. What's impressed you most since you arrived here? Asked Caesar. What? What did he say? It's as if the words make no sense. My mouth has gone dry as sawdust. I desperately find Senna in the crowd and lock eyes with him. I imagine the words coming from his lips. What impressed you most since you've arrived here? I rack my brain for something that makes me happy here. Be honest, I think. Be honest. The lamb stew. I get out. Caesar laughs, and vaguely I realize some of the audience has joined in. The one with the dried plums? Asks Caesar. I nod. Oh, I eat it by the bucketful. He turns sideways to the audience in horror, hand on his stomach. It doesn't show, does it? They shout reassurances to him and applaud. This is what I mean about Caesar. He tries to help you out. Now, Katniss, he says confidentially, when you came out in the opening ceremonies, my heart actually stopped. What did you think of that costume? Cinna raises one eyebrow at me. Be honest. You mean after I got over my fear of being burned alive? I ask. Big laugh. A real one from the audience. Yes, start then, says Caesar. Cinna, my friend, I should tell him anyway. I thought Cinna was brilliant, and it was the most gorgeous costume I'd ever seen, and I couldn't believe I was wearing it. I can't believe I'm wearing this, either. I lift up my skirt to spread it out. I mean, look at it. As the audience oohs and ahs, I see Cinna make the tiniest circular motion with his finger, but I know what he's saying. Twirl for me. I spin in a circle once, and the reaction is immediate. Oh, do that again, says Caesar. And so I lift up my arms and spin around and around, letting the skirt fly out. 
letting the dress engulf me in flames. The audience breaks into cheers. When I stop, I clutch Caesar's arm. Don't stop, he says. I have to. I'm dizzy. I'm also giggling, which I think I've done maybe never in my lifetime. But the nerves and the spinning have gotten to me. Caesar wraps a protective arm around me. Don't worry. I've got you. Can't have you falling in your mentor's footsteps. Everyone who... Everyone's hooting as the cameras find Haymitch, who is by now famous for his head dive at the reaping, and he waves them away good-naturedly and points back to me. It's all right, Caesar reassures the crowd. She's safe with me. So how about that training score? Eleven. Give us a hint what happened in there. I glance at the game makers on the balcony and bite my lip. Um, all I can say is, I think it was a first. The cameras are right on the game makers who are chuckling and nodding. You're Killing us, says Caesar as if in actual pain. Details, details. I address the balcony. I'm not supposed to talk about it, right? The game maker who fell in the punch bowl shouts out, she's not. Thank you, I say. Sorry, my lips are sealed. Let's go back then to the moment they called your sister's name at the reaping, says Caesar. His mood is quieter now. And you volunteered. Can you tell us about her? No, no, not all of you, but maybe Cinna. I don't think I'm imagining the sadness on his face. Her name's Prim. She's just 12, and I love her more than anything. You could hear a pin drop in the city circle now. What did she say to you after the reaping? Caesar asks. Be honest, be honest. I swallow hard. She asked me to try really hard to win. The audience is frozen, hanging on my every word. And what did you say? Prompts Caesar gently. But instead of warmth, I feel an icy rigidity take over my body. My muscles tense as they do before a kill. When I speak, my voice seems to have dropped an octave. I swore I would. I bet you did, says Caesar, giving me a squeeze. The buzzer goes off. Sorry, we're out of time. Best of luck, Katniss Everdeen. Tribute from District 12. The applause continues long after I'm seated. I look to Cinna for reassurance. He gives me a subtle thumbs up. I'm still in a daze for the first part of Peta's interview. He has the audience from the get-go, though. I can hear them laughing, shouting out, he plays up the baker son thing, comparing the tributes to the breads from their districts. Then has a funny anecdote about the perils of the capital showers. Tell me, do I smell like roses? He asks Caesar. And then there's a whole run where they take turns sniffing each other that brings down the house. I'm coming back into focus when Caesar asks him if he has a girlfriend back home. Peta hesitates, then gives an unconvincing shake of his head. Handsome lad like you, there must be some special girl. Come on, what's her name? says Caesar. Peter sighs. Well, there is this one girl. I've had a crush on her ever since I can remember, but I'm pretty sure she didn't know I was alive until the reaping. Sounds of sympathy from the crowd, unrequited love they can relate to. She have another fellow? asks Caesar. I don't know, but a lot of boys like her, says Peter. So here's what you do. You win. You go home. She can't turn you down then, eh? says Caesar encouragingly. I don't think it's going to work out. Winning won't help in my case, says Peta. Why ever not, says Cedar. Caesar, mystified. Peta blushes beet red and stammers out, because, because she came here with me.